thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for a great talk that you gave on, on the new book that you have published. And that is the, the 100 Greatest Americans of the 20th Century. Uh, what I'm interested in is how can we relate that book to the urban policies? You have done great work. You have done a, a large breadth of work um, within and outside of politics. You have worked for the mayors. You have worked for the administrations. You have worked with a Los Angeles mayor. Uh, and, and you're a professor and you an activist. So could you uh, sort of elaborate on the urban policies and how can we connect the book with the urban mm -hmm. policy? Well, the history of progressive politics in America really is the story of urban politics. Uh, if you think about where the, uh, the impetus for uh, progressive activism came from uh, in the early part of the, of the 20th century, it began with the slums and the sweatshops and the factories in the big cities with immigrants coming from overseas and migrants coming from rural parts of America, moving into the cities, uh, taking part in uh, the wave of industrialization, uh, the, the beginning of the sweatshop and the factory movement in this country, the exploitation of, uh, of workers, the exploitation uh, by landlords and slumlords in the slums. So if you look at a book like The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, written in 1906, it's about the, the miserable conditions in Chicago at the turn of the century among uh, immigrants working in the factory system. And out of that cauldron of misery came the labor movement, came the progressive movement to clean up the slums, came the movement against child labor, came the movement uh, to uh, improve the public health with sewer systems, came the movement to uh, create parks and public schools. Uh, it was an urban movement. And America today is a suburban country, but we have a lot of the same problems. We still have uh, poverty. Some of that poverty now is about half of all the poor in the United States live in the suburbs. Uh, we still have sweatshops and, uh, and difficult working conditions. Uh, we still have environmental and health problems. Um, and they're still concentrated in our metropolitan areas, in the cities and in the suburbs surrounding those cities, particularly what are called the inner, the inner suburbs. So uh, a lot has changed, but there are quite a few parallels between the early 1900s and the early uh, 21st century. So part of the problems that we have had uh, as a result of poverty is homelessness. And can you talk about that, especially with like Los Angeles, and you know, generally the U.S. population, and if you can bring veterans into that. Okay. Um, on any given night in America today, in the year 2012, there are probably uh, a million and a half or two million people who are homeless. They're sleeping on the streets, they're sleeping on park benches, they're sleeping in homeless shelters, they're living in overcrowded apartments uh, that are designed for one family and there's three families living there. So homelessness is a serious problem. Homelessness is really the tip of the iceberg, however, of the growing problem of poverty in America. We have about uh, 50 or 60 million Americans, depending on your definition, who live in poverty. Um, many of them are working. Many of the homeless are working. Many of the homeless work at low-wage jobs. So although the stereotype of homeless Americans is that they're mentally ill or alcoholic or have drug problems, and that's certainly true of some of them, a growing percentage of people who are homeless are working, but they're living uh, in poverty because their jobs pay poverty wages. And so there, there are sort of three solutions to the homeless problems in America. One is to provide better affordable housing so that people don't have to live on the street. A second solution is to provide uh, a social safety net so that the poor in general, not just the homeless, uh, if they're out of work or if they have an emergency, they get health insurance, they get food stamps, they get um, cash assistance, they get ways of, of a cushion between themselves uh, and uh, their daily lives and deep, desperate misery. And the third, of course, is to strengthen the labor movement uh, to increase wages and, and improve working conditions so that people don't have to work full time and live in poverty. So you have, you have work on, um, it's called United for a Fair Economy. Mm -hmm. 
So can you elaborate that with um, type of work that you're talking about, getting rid of poverty and social safety networks? Mm -hmm. In every city in America, there are grassroots organizations, <clears throat> nonprofit groups, labor unions, working on the front lines of the struggle for a better world, for social justice, to eliminate poverty. Here in Los Angeles, I think the, 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 the number of organizations and the movement for justice is probably stronger than in any other city. I work very closely with a group called LANE, the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, which does community organizing and labor organizing and research to force the businesses in Los Angeles to improve the conditions for their employees and to get the city government to do things like clean up the dirty port of LA to improve working conditions for people that work uh, at the port and in other uh, sectors of the economy. There are other organizations working with the homeless, a group like LA Community Action Network. There are groups like, uh, we used to be ACORN, but it's now called ACE, which is a community organizing group, National People's Action, uh, Voice, PICO, lots of great organizations. Right? So in every city, there's, there are organizations that are, are building a movement for social justice, but they often work in isolation from each other. And the, the key to building a progressive movement what I learned from writing my book, The 100 Greatest Americans of the 20th Century, is that the progressive movement is most effective when people working on different issues, on labor, housing, environment, women's rights, gay rights, they work together, they form a coalition. That's the message that Michael Harrington uh, spoke of when he was uh, active in the United States in the 1960s and 70s in the anti-poverty movement and wanted to bring what he called the, the left wing of the Democratic Party, the coalition together, and build a movement for social justice. And I think urban, urban policy in America, urban politics in America, uh, is, uh, uh, is undermined the extent to which each of these different organizations work in isolation from each other. Um, just the other day, the city of uh, San Bernardino declared bankruptcy. All over America, cities are teetering on the brink of fiscal collapse. It's not because these cities are poorly managed. There are some cities that are poorly managed. There are some cities where the city officials are corrupt. But in most cases, in 9 out of 10 cases, or maybe even 99 out of 100 cases, the cities don't have enough money because of the Wall Street crash, the declining housing values, the declining property values. So cities don't have enough money to provide the basic services that a wealthy country like the United States uh, should be able to provide. Education, health care, uh, sanitation, good sewer systems, uh, public safety. Uh, we really have to realize that the, the crisis of our cities is part of a larger crisis in our country. Um, and underlying it all are the misguided priorities at the national level where we spend so much money on the military and, and on weapons of destruction, uh, that we don't have enough money to pay for the education, health care, uh, and uh, public safety and other basic essentials that uh, people should expect, much less allow people to take a four or five week vacation every year like they do in most other industrialized countries. Um, there's a wonderful organization called the uh, National Priorities Project that has a great website. And anybody that lives anywhere in the United States can go on their website and find out how much money their city, their congressional district, and their, um, their state and county is sending to Washington that goes to fight the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, Iraq and the larger military industrial complex. And it also has this great part of it which says if we spent that money on school teachers, if we spent that money on Head Start programs, if we spent that money on affordable housing, if we spent that money uh, with financial aid for college students, how much better would our society be? And so I think you know, the urban crisis in America is really part of a national crisis of misplaced priorities. Now I want to bring it back to your book okay. and thank yeah. you very much. And that's yeah. your book, the title of your book is The 100 Greatest <coughs> Americans of the 20th Century. You, I was reading about it that uh, it seems like your book should be taught in schools. And you just mentioned education system and all that. Yeah. Can you elaborate why people, in, those who are in your book, are not known to 
uh, kids in school and high school. Wow. So um, one of the themes of my book uh, is that the radical ideas of one generation is often the common sense of the next generation. So the ideas that we now take for granted, like social security and um, the minimum wage and giving women the right to vote and an end to lynching and workers having the right to unionize and federal laws protecting consumers against unsafe products uh, and an unsafe workplace and environmental hazards. Those ideas back in 1900 were considered radical, socialist, communist, utopian. Anybody who would propose any of those things back then would be considered a dreamer. Victor Berger was a socialist congressman from Milwaukee who in 1911 proposed the first old age insurance. It took another 25 years before, uh, during the New Deal, the Depression, that Congress passed Social Security. And so um, I wrote the book to, uh, to help people to learn about, particularly young people, to learn about the fact that we are standing on the shoulders of these incredible people, many of whom they've never heard about. I mean, everybody's heard of Martin Luther King, and most people have heard of uh, uh, Walter Ruther, the union leader, although maybe people haven't heard about Walter Ruther. But, um, but there are many people in the book that uh, are basically invisible uh, to the ordinary American because they don't, we don't teach about these people in our schools, on the History Channel, on television, um, uh, and, and we don't honor and celebrate these people. And even uh, people who uh, were famous you know, 40 or 50 or 75 years ago, like Jane Addams, right, who is now, if anybody understands her life at all, they think of her as the founding mother of social work. But she was also a founder of the NAACP, a civil rights activist, a civil liberties activist, a suffragist who fought for women to get the right to vote, a pacifist who opposed World War I. Uh, she was you know, a dedicated, committed radical. And so I want uh, young people today to learn the stories of these great people and to realize that they can be that way too, that they can participate in the same kinds of movements. And that's why the last chapter of the book is about the 20th, first century and some of the great things that have been happening in this country in the last 12 years that, uh, that identify people who 50 years from now might be in a book similar to mine as the greatest Americans of the 21st century who, who moved America in a more democratic, inclusive, and fair direction. So one last question, and, yeah. and that has to do with Woody, Woody Guthrie, his 100th uh, birthday yeah. anniversary yeah. was yesterday. Yeah. And he's one of those people, and in your book, could you talk about him? Woody Guthrie was America's troubadour, and he, uh, he lived in Los Angeles for part of his life. He mostly lived in New York. He grew up in, uh, in Oklahoma. Um, and he sang songs to give voice to the working people of America their hopes, their fears, and their aspirations. Uh, he wrote books about uh, landlords evicting people from their homes and banks. He wrote, uh, he wrote songs about migrant workers. He wrote songs about the, the beautiful uh, wilderness and the, uh, and, the, and the land of the country. Um, he wrote uh, songs about the public works uh, during the New Deal. He wrote a whole group of songs about the um, Bonneville Power Administration up in Oregon and Washington and the new dams that were bringing electricity to rural parts of America. Um, he's most famous for This Land is Your Land, which to many people is the real national anthem. The song that says that uh, this land is made for you and me, that we're all in this together, uh, which is I think a much better song than our, than our real national anthem. Um, and, uh, and Woody Guthrie was uh, unfortunately uh, taken with a, a chronic illness and he died in his 50s and the last 10 years of his life, uh, he died in 1967, the last 10 years of his life he basically was incapacitated. So other people have carried on in his tradition. Obviously Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, they're both in my book. Phil Oakes, who's not in my book but maybe should have been. Uh, was another one. And today we have Bruce Springsteen, who very much thinks of himself in the tradition of Woody Guthrie, and Tom Morello, uh, who used to work, uh, who now calls himself the Night Watchman, but used to be with Rage Against the Machine. So there's a long tradition in American history of troubadours for justice 
uh, along with writers and artists and theologians and thinkers, people that inspire us, people that uh, give us hope, people that allow us to dream. Uh, and those people I thought were important to include in the book. And uh, this year, which is, as you said, the 100th anniversary of Woody Guthrie's birth, uh, July 14th, 1912 was when he was born. Um, uh, there's a whole national celebration called Woody at 100. And almost every major city in the country, there are museum exhibits and conferences and concerts that are happening all over. And I really urge people to look up the website Woody at 100 and find some of those celebrations near them because um, uh, Woody deserves to be celebrated. His life and legacy is extraordinary. Anything you would like to No, I'm quite there. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very good.